So becoming conformant is very critical. Um, the, if you are implementing an, a Kronos specification, if you're not conformant, your products are not protected by the IP framework. So uh, we have a process by which members can become uh, conformant. Uh, you download, you pay a small fee, um, which is around 10,000 US dollars, which is a very small fee compared to other organizations. You download the source, you get access to the source code, you download it, you port it onto your own product, you up upload just the results, and the results are peer-reviewed by the working group. And then after 30 days, if there are no issues, you are conformant, you enjoy the IP protection, and you can use the logo and the trademark uh, on your product. So that's how Kronos works. Uh, let's look at the uh, types of APIs that we've been creating and the evolving demand of the industry because the types of APIs we're creating are changing uh, over time. When we were first uh, formed, all of the uh, APIs were for desktop machines and workstations. This was over 10 years ago. So OpenGL, OpenCL, uh, typically used on machines you plug uh, into the wall. And still, even today, some of the very latest high-end API, API technology is first developed for desktop machines. But increasingly, now, the center of innovation is the mobile industry. And the mobile phones, smartphones, require all the same functionality, graphics, computation, vision processing, as PCs did just a few years ago. And so we need mobile APIs like OpenGL ES that provide this functionality, but also enable very low power implementations so you can run these devices on a battery. But those APIs a few years ago, they could exist in isolation. You could have a graphics API, you could have a video API, and really they didn't really need to talk to each other. That's changed now. The new generation of applications, like augmented reality, for example, use vision, graphics, uh, video processing, image processing, sensor processing, all very closely interoperated. So Kronos now is working to create this family of APIs that are designed to work together, not just to exist in isolation. And then the very latest uh, evolution now is the web. HTML5 is becoming a very important cross-operating system programming framework uh, to program your car, your set-top box, your TV, your DVD player, as well as your mobile phone. But we need this advanced functionality, so we're beginning to develop these web APIs to complement the native APIs that we've developed uh, before. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the augmented reality and the vision processing. These are the APIs that are still being created. So we don't yet have detailed presentations uh, because uh, we don't have the specifications yet. But it's interesting, I hope, to give you some um, insight into the kind of new APIs that hopefully next year will be here and we'll be able to give you uh, more details about. Uh, augmented reality is, is a very interesting application. It, it forces many of the APIs uh, to work together in new ways and to do it in real time. And an augmented reality application um, means you have to bring in the camera, you send the camera video stream to a feature, an object tracker. So you're tracking in real time through vision processing the objects in the scene, so you can determine down to the pixel level where the phone is pointing. Then you create 3D information and objects that enhance the scene, and you superimpose those, composite them together with the original uh, video stream coming from the camera. So there's a lot of processing going on here, and everything has to work seamlessly together. So what are the, some, some of the key processing steps. 
a really strong theme for many different application vendors is that they want to use the sensors in the mobile device. Mobile phones are having more and more sensors packed into these small mobile packages. <coughs> three, well, two, three, four cameras, stereo pairs, backwards and forwards, are coming soon. Uh, motion uh, sensors, uh, gyros, GPS, compass, uh, barometer, temperature, uh, humidity, touch screens, uh, buttons, wireless devices, wireless joysticks, many different types of sensors. The problem for the application developer is they need to have high quality processing of all of these sensors, but they want to write portable code. And very often today, without a standard API, you have to know exactly what sensors are on the device and how to use them in a lot of detail to get the best performance and the best power consumption. We need an API that gives portable access to the developer and is high enough that the sensor vendors and the middleware vendors can innovate in their middleware to provide the best possible sensor processing. So, stream input lets an application request high-level semantic information. If you're doing a connect type game and you want to have skeleton information so you can have natural gesture control. With stream input, you would say, give me a high quality skeleton tracking at 30 frames a second. The stream input middleware would create a graph of processing that takes the available sensors and produces the best possible skeleton stream back to uh, the application. The application doesn't need to know whether it's a depth camera or a stereo pair of RGB cameras or even just a single camera if the middleware is smart enough. The application just knows it gets high quality uh, data uh, to use in this application and it can be portable to different devices. So we can enable uh, these devices to have uh, a lot of situational awareness and we can begin to create uh, virtual sensors. So we can, for example, ask uh, Stream Input to provide a callback if the device detects that it's in an elevator or being driven in a car at over 15 miles an hour or is being carried in a hip pocket or being carried in a backpack. The sensor vendors know how to provide this information in a very efficient way. Stream input will enable them to deliver that information uh, portably to the applications. It seems like a big uh, task, but we have many leading experts in the stream input working group. PrimeSense, for example, is the technology prov provider behind the Kinect. They actually provide the camera in the Kinect device that Microsoft uses. And they have an API called OpenNI, which is their proprietary uh, API for doing things like skeleton processing. They have contributed OpenNI to Kronos, and we're developing the next generation of API using that as a starting point. We also have their Arch enemy, uh, Arch competitor, Soft Kinetic, who also have depth camera technology. So it's very interesting these competitors come together to work to create uh, the next generation API that is better than any one API that any one company could do alone. And Soft Kinetic are now the specification editor for Stream Input. I mean, companies like Sensor Platforms um, and others that are uh, leading experts in uh, sensor middleware uh, uh, provision. So we're aiming to have a specification release in 2012. So this year, we hope to have the first draft specification publicly release for stream input. Vision processing is an important part of this new generation. We want to use the cameras very efficiently. It's certainly uh, useful in aug augmented reality, for example. Many companies in the past have used OpenCV for doing computer vision processing. In the past, OpenCV is a great library. It's lots of functionality. 
Uh, it's not a kernel standard. Uh, it's an open source project. And many people have contributed uh, to OpenCV uh, over the years. The problem with OpenCV is that it's hard to accelerate on hardware, like or G, for example, GPUs or DSPs, because there's over a thousand functions in OpenCV. And for example, my own company, NVIDIA, we have tried to accelerate OpenCV. We have taken about 20 functions on top of CUDA, uh, and it works okay. But we say, okay, 20 functions done. Oh, now we have 980 other functions to do. This is never gonna finish. Uh, it's not a way to accelerate the whole of OpenCV. So the industry through Kronos has decided that it would be better way to accelerate vision to define a low-level hardware acceleration layer. A low-level library like OpenGL for graphics, OpenVL for vision. Once we define this, then the hardware vendors can create an accelerated OpenVL library and then OpenCV and other libraries too, of course, and all applications directly can use that accelerated uh, vision uh, functionality. We have the, the key maintainers of OpenCV, uh, Widow Garage and ITSEES. They're the companies who have been maintaining and developing OpenCV over the last 10 years. They have now joined Kronos and they are helping to define uh, this API because they see this is the best way to let OpenCV get to the power of GPU and DSP and multi-core CPU uh, uh, parallel processing. So this working group has just started. Uh, we have uh, a meeting next week at Intel in Santa Clara where we'll be uh, pushing forward uh, this initiative. Yes, please. What kind of hardware is being used for that's a great question. So the question was, what types of hardware will OpenVL support for acceleration? And the answer is uh, a wide range. So the, the key uh, targets that the group is working on is uh, multi-core CPU, uh, GPU, and DSP. Those are the three main architectures that we want to make sure that can be used to implement an accelerated OpenVL. So we're working to make sure it's not just GPUs, for example, but CPUs and DSPs as well. It's almost the same as the uh, Yes, exactly. Exactly, exactly the same. In fact, I have a slide in the moment that shows many people might choose to use OpenCL to implement OpenVL. Uh, it's a choice that you have. But yes, it's exactly. And OpenCL now, as you probably know, is also being used on FPGAs too. So it's broadening the type of hardware to be broader. Okay, so augmented reality, um, we can now uh, draw a processing graph for augmented reality for the first time that uses 100% open standards. So augmented reality type applications can be portable. So let's look at the, the, the pieces that we need. We need to do camera processing. We need sophisticated camera control. We need low-level image processing. Uh, we can use OpenMax AL uh, to do that processing. OpenMax AL can feed the video uh, into a computer vision tracking uh, software module that can be used, uh, OpenVL or OpenCL, uh, to do that acceleration. We need to bring in the other sensors, such as the uh, accelerometer, gyro, and uh, GPS, and fuse all that sensor information together and put it into the application. We can use stream input for that. We need to generate the 3D augmentations, the information, and we can use OpenGL ES, of course, for that and to do uh, the composition. We need to route the video very efficiently into the GPU, and we have the new EGL extension called EGL Stream. Uh, which has only been released a couple months, but is already getting a lot of adoption uh, amongst the silicon and the OS vendors. It lets you very efficiently pass a stream of images from uh, video to 3D subsystems, for example. 
and last but not least, we need um, audio processing, um, probably with 3D positional audio and OpenSL ES is a sound function. We've only been able to draw this, this graph using open standards for uh, two or three months, so this is a very uh, state of the art. And to, to the question, how do all these vision topic things interrelate? Um, we're trying to be careful to make sure that there's a rational stack here. Um, so for example, you can choose, it's not mandatory, you can choose to implement your OpenVL over OpenCL, if you wish. Uh, you can certainly use OpenVL for accelerating OpenCV. You can use OpenCV to do the feature and object tracking as part of a stream input sense of fusion graph. We're going to make sure that OpenVL and OpenMaxAL interoperate very well through EGL. Uh, so you can use OpenMaxAL for the camera control and low-level image processing. Again, it's not mandated. You have the choice. But if you want to use open standards, we'll make sure that this works. And then finally, making sure that OpenVL works alongside OpenGL and OpenCL so you can do peer graphics, compute, and vision processing, uh, and everything works uh, very efficiently. So having these APIs is good, um, but if they don't ship in real systems, of course, it doesn't uh, uh, do, uh, and it doesn't make any difference. But the good news is these APIs are being deployed in many different operating systems. Android is just one operating system. It is a very interesting mobile operating system because it's being used in more mobile devices than any other right now. Uh, the shipment figures for Android are you know, exceeding that of um, iOS, the Apple, um, both are great OSs, but Android you know, actually has more on. And the good news is Android is now shipping in uh, mul multiple APIs uh, in the standard platform. So OpenGLES has been shipping uh, in Android since Android 2.2, uh, OpenSLES since Android 2.3, OpenMax AL is shipping in the latest Android 4, that's an ice cream sandwich. EGL has been in Android for many years, but it's been hidden in the system, uh, but it's now getting closer and closer to being exposed directly to the developers. Uh, Google has not yet adopted OpenCL or Stream Input or OpenVL. Uh, some of them are still being created. But we're working to add value with these APIs, and we're hopeful that Google will adopt them uh, very soon. And even before Google officially adopts these APIs, OEMs can ship them as extensions to the Android NDK. Um, so the NDK provides the flexibility to add additional API functionality alongside the APIs that Google uh, uh, defines themselves. Now we need to be careful. OEM shouldn't change the Google functionality because that would be fragmentation. But adding new functionality alongside, using open standards is a good opportunity for differentiation. So uh, my last slide uh, before I hand over to John uh, Petty is to just give a uh, quick heads up. We're working on a new initiative. Um, we're not announcing the details yet, but we're, this is one of our other key focuses. Um, the kernels members in the industry put a lot of effort into creating these APIs. We're now beginning to reach out to the educator community to help them teach these APIs, providing information, uh, best practices to the education community uh, so students uh, get better course materials and get uh, the opportunity to be tested with standardized examinations uh, so uh, they can understand the cross APIs uh, better and uh, become more skilled and get better jobs. So the uh, finishing up, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are really committed to building the bridge between Kronos and China. Uh, Kronos has uh, strong APIs uh, China is becoming a global leader in the mobile industry. Uh, it does make sense for the two to work together. Uh, it's a big benefit, we feel, to Chinese companies. Uh, Kronos needs Chinese participation 
if we're going to remain uh, uh, able to truly meet the needs of the global uh, uh, industry, and we could avoid the costs and confusion of fragmenting uh, China versus the rest of the world, uh, it will be of benefit to everyone. So we're going to be reaching out to uh, silicon vendors, mobile OEMs, mobile carriers here in China. Uh, we've actually been coming to China for many years, but we're going to really increase uh, our efforts here. Uh, our next visit, for example, we're coming to uh, the China Game Developer Conference uh, here in Shanghai uh, in July. So I hope to see some of you uh, there. So in summary, hopefully uh, we've covered uh, how these APIs, the kernels are defining, are key to defining the new generations of mobile devices and enabling applications to access to advanced silicon uh, functionality. These APIs, they no longer exist alone. They are now interoperating uh, to form uh, an advanced platform for content such as augmented reality. Uh, we have more and more cooperation between the native APIs and the web APIs to bring content into HTML5, and we'll cover that more later today. And then finally, uh, Kronos is driving these open standards, and if your company is active in this kind of domain, we would really welcome your participation you know, to help us create these standards uh, that meet your needs and the needs of the industry. Thank you very much. Yes, questions? Yeah. What about the Window A system? So, Microsoft, if you notice the, the logo slide, Microsoft is the one OS vendor that is not a member. And the Microsoft um, are defining their own API set. And with Windows 8, uh, WinRT, uh, they are currently restricting uh, the APIs on the platform. So we will no longer be able to ship OpenGL or OpenCL or CUDA or anything on Windows. It seems uh, a lot of Kronos members um, are concerned by that. And uh, we are in discussions with Microsoft to see whether we can work together with them to provide more flexibility on Windows on our platform. But currently, the current plan of record for Microsoft is that you will have Microsoft only APIs uh, on Windows. But of course, um, in the mobile space, um, you know, Google and Android have together over 80% of the market share.